Russell, we're going live, guys. Front doors. And just we leave some live the right closed. now. So live and in color. I'm well, in color. Here we are. So I like to run our open first. So yes, gonna... Sci-Fi Facebook does say that we are in fact okay. live. Share and share. Here we go. Open. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody to Sci-Fi Distilled, a very special episode. I got to welcome Doug Drexler and Mike and Denise Okuda. You guys have probably worked on more Star Trek than anybody ever. Maybe. <laughs> well, an awful lot. An awful lot. We worked on it until they threw us out. Yeah. yeah they, th <laughs> they kicked so. us out and changed locks. <laughs> so before we get too far it's into it, I got to do our drink because I always forget our drink. We always forget the drink. Let's get that out of the way so we can quick. dive in. And then we'll dive in. So uh, here it is. It's, today is the Andorian Ale. Just two ounces of raspberry vodka. An ounce wow. of curacao, Sprite, a little mint, and that's it. And Shram approved. The, uh, wow. So... <laughs> Cheers. That'll be on, that's on the website, but I'll, I'll, if you want it, you guys can always freeze the video and yeah. mix your drink. So, so cheers, cheers and everybody. thank you all for being here. Our pleasure. I'm drinking Italian lemonade. This is uh, oh. lemonade, limoncello, and uh, vodka, lemon vodka. So oh. it is, it is, but I have I to say I cheated because it came out of a can. <laughs> so we lost Mike already. No, he's, he's <laughs> he, he decided you guys inspired him. He went to go get something to drink. You went to go make some cocktail. Okay, right? always, always allowed on this show. All right. Always take a cocktail. Wait break. a minute. Okay, he's back. He's, he's back. back. So while he's while he's getting his there you oh we got a shaker, a mixer, we're good to go. So wow. while he's he's doing that, can you explain it? to us? What are you making? Is it something delicious? <laughs> yeah. Can you kind Is of walk us? Walk us through your process a little bit. So what happened for you guys? So you'd get a script and it would say, we need thus and such creative minds assemble and off you went. Is that how it worked? Like what was your process from script to the actual set? We worked for the production designer. The production designer is the, is the guy or the gal who interprets the script, figures out what the director needs, figures out what the producer wants, figures out what the budget and the schedule were, uh, will, will permit. We were very lucky on Star Trek. We had production designers like Herman Zimmerman and uh, Richard James, who mostly trusted us. We, uh, they would just come up to us and say, you got something for that set? And we'd go, oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and then they'd walk away confidently and we'd say, what are we gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> Doug! And uh, and Doug would say, "Well, you know, <laughs> you know what I remember is Herman sticking his head in the in the graphics department and saying, oh, by the way, Doug, or oh, oh, oh yeah, Doug. oh Dougie, oh yeah. Dougie, oh by the way, we used to call them OBTWs. What? Did you ever propose something and they were like?" Or, of course. Or they just like, yeah, roll with it. Usually. Most of the time they'd say roll with it. Every once in a while they'd go, you know, I don't think we can afford that. Or so what you learn to do is you learn you learn to say, what can I afford to do with the uh with the uh, already approved budget? So if if we went to them and said, Hey, I, I want to do a big matrix of of video monitors, we say, Hey Denise, how many monitors can, uh, can we can we do we have in stock? Because then that, that, that doesn't trigger additional costs. Yeah. Whereas if, if I said, I want to rent uh, two dozen more monitors, they'd go, eh. And they wouldn't like that. So what, what was the fun part? Like, was it the thinking, it, like, was it like the challenge or was it finally seeing it on the set? Like, what was the part that just made your heart go pitter patter? The fun part is going, hmm, you know, if we did this, wouldn't that be cool? And we'd all get excited, and 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 Doug would say, "Well, what? what, what let's do that instead." And then Denise would say, "Well, you know, we got this." 
Yeah, well, one of the great things is that it was a great family environment, you know, and we were also comfortable with one another. And we knew each other really well, even after a short period of time, we felt like we'd known each other for a while. And uh, it, you could just bounce off one another. Uh, and that's what's really thrilling, you know. You could be on a great show where you don't have an environment like that. <clears throat> and even though it's a great show, it's not as fun as the kind of environment we had, you know, in the art department with Herman and, you know, I mean, Herman was a great boss. He really trusted, you know, he rarely got involved with telling you where to put a button on a panel, you know, ever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, we had such a, we had a great- What would you say is one of the most difficult tasks they gave you as far as actually, you know, they said, we want this, we need this. Biggest challenge. Yeah. What, yeah, what was it most say, Jesus, how are we gonna do that? One of the biggest challenges was at the very beginning of Next Generation, uh, I am I grew up loving the original Star Trek and I wanted the Enterprise D graphics to look a lot like the uh, uh, what Matt Jeffries had done for, uh, uh, for the original Enterprise. And I mentioned that uh, to Gene. And Gene said, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. <laughs> he wanted the, his new ship to be very different from the original. And so that was the first thing he told me. He said, don't make it like what we had before. And so suddenly all the ideas I had were like, oh, I guess I can't do that. I guess I got to come up with, with, with something something new. Now, Matt, did he, he designed the D interior too as well? No? no Matt, Matt had nothing to do with it. Uh, with really? That, by the time he was, he was retired. Okay. So it's all, all you guys. I'm sorry? So it's all you guys. Well, all it's... You. Yeah. Yeah, Meaning well, Herman. The art department Herman. that had... Art department. Department. Herman, uh, Herman Zimmerman, Sandy Veneziano, uh, Andy Probert, uh, Rick Sternbach, mm -hmm. uh, Les Go um, uh Okay. Uh, uh, Dick McKenzie, uh, uh, who is that? James. Huh? So, uh, anyway, in the mill too. I mean, uh, no, it was quite stuff. a group effort, is what yeah. you huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it all is a group effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Herman, it has Herman to be. tells that story about the guy in the mill who made the rail on the Enterprise D. Uh, we have it on video. Yeah. It's a very moving story, um, and how far people will go to do a good job. Um, uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, was it his name? Was it his last name Wood? Something like that, yeah. It's yeah, right. like Jim Wood or something like that. And there that, was a there plaque was a, on the um, bottom of the rail dedicating it yeah. to him. Um, that, that the thing was that Andy had designed this rail with Herman that everyone looked at and said, well, I don't know how to make that <laughs> because of the way it would curve. And so, you know, right. I mean, now you could do it in a computer maybe and but the thing was that nobody in the mill really knew how to make that thing. And there was one guy who said, I know how to do that. And it was- And he you know, spent weeks building it up. Uh, it, it was it was these compound ellipses, not just compound curves, compound ellipses. So it was it was curved in, in, in two axes. And he would, three axes, I think. And how do you how do you build that? Uh, Les Gabrugi, the, uh, uh, um, Draftsman figured out how, how to how to how to draw it and uh, uh, as a blueprint. But how do you build it? So he uh, this guy figured out how to build these two fences representing the front and the back of it, and then he built it up layer by layer, a thirty second of an inch at a time. Just just laminated it, and 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 kept adjusting it and kept curving it and kept bending it, and it was it was his passion. He spent weeks in the uh, in the mill putting that together must have weighed a ton it was well yeah. then after he finished building it they, they hollowed it out so it wasn't quite so heavy but yes it, it, it did weigh a ton and in the middle of it all he got into this terrible motorcycle accident and he insisted on coming back to work he, he insisted on finishing the thing even though everybody said go home get better and he's he 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 stayed at his post and the other trainees ran. He stayed at <laughs> his post and he finished it and then he died. Oh my God. Yeah. 
When Herman tells the story, he's got his eyes are tearing up. Yeah. 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 Okay, we need to get cheerier. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I want to say yeah, hi to everybody who's. Yeah, go ahead and say hi. We've got tons yeah, of people, got a lot of people tuning in tonight. I see some new names and faces tuning in tonight. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep, Bruce is there. I see Henry Jackson. How you doing? Ron Ashman, Dave, Paul Petty. Thanks, guys, for coming. Uh, Joe and, uh, excuse me, John and Sue. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people I don't recognize, no, no, but hey, no. you're all uh, welcome. Hi. That's great. <laughs> is this on YouTube? Can I see it on YouTube? It's on, on Facebook. Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Just We're look for Sci-Fi Distilled. Nice sci-fi Distilled. So, I want to see the so yeah, if you guys have questions, post them up. We'll try to get them to them um, so that they can answer it. So what would be, let's, all right, we got to hear a funny story. There, I know there must be a ton of funny stories <laughs> over all the shows you guys did and movies. So what would you say is the funniest thing? I know Doug's got a good one when he's- I do? Yes, you were- Oh yeah, I got a couple. But <laughs> <laughs> that story, go ahead, tell that story, Doug, because that's a good one. Well, I don't know which one. He, uh, he know, wants to hear the John Delancey, Delancey story. <laughs> <laughs> that's gotten to be a famous one. Yeah. You know, I, I, I got this. <laughs> I, I was working in the, um, you know, the makeup department on TNG had a little like shack on the stage behind the trick stages. Uh, and it was a whole, real hole in the wall. And uh, me and Jerry Quist were in there. And Mike Westmore comes in one day and says, they don't have a, you need, you know, you actually have to be a body makeup artist to put body makeup on someone. There's a, but if there's no one available, anybody can do it. So he gave me a, uh, he gave me a pancake uh, with a wet sponge. It's like water soluble. And he says, go to John Delancey's trailer. There's a scene on the bridge where he's like pretty much naked. And uh, just go to his trailer and knock on the door and go and, you know, do his body makeup. So, you know, there's no blemishes and stuff like that. And I went to his trailer and he's on the phone, like arguing with somebody. I don't know who. He was totally oblivious to me. He just took his, you know, his, his uh, gown or his shower robe off and standing there like buck naked with a phone arguing with someone while I'm like, and you know, the funny thing about these sponges, it, it feels like a cow is licking me. You know, the sponge is wet. And it's like, I don't know how he could even ignore me. And uh, so I finally got the whole thing done and the second AD comes in and says they, they need John on stage now. So I followed him into stage. You know, when you go into stage, it's like that bright California sun. And then when you go through that heavy door and it thuds closed behind you, your eyes aren't adjusted yet. And it's so freaking cold on stage, it's really cold. So I follow John through, uh, you know, there's a shortcut through Picard's ready room and onto the bridge where the whole crew is there waiting for Delancey. And uh, uh, Delancey's there, I don't remember, I think he had like a little G string that he wore, but otherwise he was like com completely naked. And he's standing there and, uh, uh, the director was Les Landau. And I knew Les even before I came to Star Trek because his brother was a producer on Dick Tracy. So, uh, and, and this was after we had gotten an Academy Award for Dick Tracy and Les sees me. And I could see that he's got, he's gonna, you know, give me, he's gonna give me a hard time in front of the whole crew. And I was the butt of the joke, so to speak. <laughs> He walks up to Delancey and points to a spot. The whole crew is there, right? I, oh, and, and the other thing is, if I come on stage, you know, someone like uh, LeVar Burton will announce me as, ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award winning makeup artist, Doug Drexler. It was always so embarrassing for me. And so he would delight in embarrassing me. And here's Delancey, buck naked. Les Landau sees me, here's LeVar, you know, uh, do his speech about Academy Award winning makeup artist and Les walks up to uh, Delancey's butt and points to a spot on and says, makeup, <laughs> and says, you missed the spot. And I'm like walking up with that. And I'm like putting makeup on his butt <laughs> and Les turns to the crew and says, ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award winning <laughs> makeup artist, Doug Drexler. That was a great moment. It's still it's the third moments. time I've heard you tell it. It's still funny. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, what about you guys? You must have something Here, similar. Well, uh, this is actually a, this is actually a makeup story as well. I'm uh, one day we we're shooting an episode where it was a holodeck scene, and um, it was a Shakespearean Shakespearean thing. And um, always next to the set, you have a, a big long table called craft service where, where there's coffee and usually snacks or whatever. It's basically the, the crew agrees that we'll stick around set. We won't go after the commissary if you provide us food. So that so that that's the deal. So it's early in the morning. I checked checked, up, checked out the set. There, there was there was nothing I needed to uh, to take care of. But I went over to get a cup of coffee and I'm stirring my coffee. And this, this guy comes up behind me. And he said, and he, he mumbles something to me and I'm going, I, I just nod politely and I move, move off and I put whatever I put in my coffee. And he comes to, to me, uh, he sidles even closer and he, he mumbles again and I'm going, who is this guy? And I look at him and he bursts out laughing. It's Patrick Stewart in his, in, 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 uh, in his uh, Henry, what, Henry the fifth. Uh, Listen to Henry the fifth. That makeup yeah, on yeah. him. And Doug put yes. that makeup on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny, you know, um, Mike asked me to put that makeup on Patrick. And it was- Mike Westman. I mean, look, I, I came to TNG a big fan and, uh, uh, now I'm in the makeup trailer and now I'm going to put a makeup on Patrick Stewart, you know, and uh, Mike gave me the pieces. Westmore gave me the pieces and the hair and all that stuff. And um, I put the makeup on him. He was great to work on, uh, although I did another makeup on him where he was like falling asleep. At anyway, I put that makeup on him and I was so thrilled to put it on him and he loved it. And he went, he did just what Mike was talking about. He was running around in costume, accosting people, and they didn't know that it was him. And he loved that whole thing. Um, but um, uh, after it was just for one holodeck shot, and uh, he came back. I took the makeup off him, and uh, he got back into his Picard. He had to go down to the green to green screen and shoot a scene for the holodeck scene as Captain Picard. And so now Mike Westmore says, go with him to stage and just look after him. And now I'm standing with Captain Picard now, you know, and it's like, he's telling me what a wonderful job he thought I did on that. And it, I felt like a crewman. I felt like an enterprise crewman who was being complimented by his captain. It wasn't an actor to me. It was Captain Picard, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and, and he, being a, a, a Shakespearean-trained actor, I'm sure he probably enjoyed that makeup more than the average. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I put a, another Mike Westmore makeup on him for Inner Light, where he lives a whole life. Right. And he is, and, yeah. Yeah, and he was looking at the makeup around his eyes, like this far away from a mirror, and pointing to stuff. And I said, Patrick, you know, if they could see that, we could all just go home right now. You know, forget, forget. Of course, this is before HD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but the thing is that makeup technology, makeup and computers have crossed each other now. You see it a lot in the Marvel movies where you will take a makeup so far and finish it with the computer. Right. You know, like a character right. like Vision in the Avengers is right. half makeup, half CG. Mm -hmm. So now if a makeup, you know, on TN, on Dick Tracy, on Next Generation, on Deep Space Nine, whatever you saw on television, that was the makeup raw. That's the way it looked on stage. Now they'll take the makeup and smooth it out. There's no such thing as a bad edge anymore. They just. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. So in our, so I want to kind of ask you guys about that. In our travels on Sci-Fi to Still, we've looked at a lot of different movies and a lot of folks say they prefer practical effects to computer effects. So in your work, in design, in the, your hands-on work, which do you prefer? Do you enjoy using the computer or do you enjoy building actual practic you know, practical things? Each has yeah. a Yeah, I mean, I find, I find that um, 
there's an emotional attachment that people have to building real models mm -hmm. uh, that especially uh, people who are a little older who always built models and then have to see things being done by CG. I find some people like are offended by CG and it's really a mortality thing more than anything that you see time marching on and you don't want to see that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you want it, you want to see the model, the, the ships as physical models. Um, I, I've, you know, me, Mike, Denise have lived the transition from physical to CG and we've done both. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I love a toy. I love to have a toy. I like the idea that there's an actual ship, you know, but you know, it's like, for instance, on Orville, the first half of the first season, they used the physical model of the Orville. And it, you just can't get as much out of a physical model as you can out of a CG model. But, uh, the potential is is so much greater and models fall apart and they break and the lights mm -hmm. go out and they get you know dirty and yeah I, I love a toy ship too you know I mean I, I, who, who wouldn't love a five foot enterprise or an 11 foot <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but yeah, at computers the, at are the, fantastic yeah but at the same time uh, I'm I haven't been done anywhere near as much CG work as uh, as Doug but I've been involved in, in building physical models and props, and I've been involved in building some CG things. And in both cases, you 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 can you you, you get into it, and you and you have this satisfaction of, well, if I had a little bit more thing, oh, isn't that cool? Let's do that. And and you and you can have fun. Uh, at the same time, as a viewer, I've seen wonderful CG work. I've seen terrible CG work. I've seen wonderful physical models is in terrible physical models. And what I always used to uh, used to say in the art department, it's not the tool, it's the hand that drives the tool. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah, it's the hand that drives the tool. Well, the I thing mean, is that it comes down to the dollar and you get more a bang for your buck, dollar I mean, wise, with CG. Obviously the old, the, the model stuff is still holding up. You watch 2001 Space Odyssey, those effects still, you can watch that in 4K and it's still good. You know what yes, I'm saying? But, but and and 2001 is a high water mark i love it it's my favorite film but there are a lot of things that they couldn't do the discovery could move with great beauty and grace and and uh and detail and realism but it couldn't turn during a shot and they also had the benefit of time i mean that film was unbelievable and the 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 attention to detail and they had time which a lot of time especially in television you just don't have time right but if you my my i guess my point was you're looking at a film that was made in the late late 60s and you know here we are 50 years some odd years later and it still holds up i mean it's not like oh you could tell that was made in the late 60s i think they could have made if i saw that movie they could have been made you know last year and i think it would have worked but so, I, I, but again it was it was tailored to to some very very specific limitation there, there's a shot where for example the uh, 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 the moonlander it's flying across frame toward toward the moon actually going, going away and because of the way they animated it it could not cross in front of the moon it could not do that so you can time it exactly to the frame when they cut away cut away <laughs> well certainly certainly you could do more with CGI than you could with physical models I mean I'm sure I'm not arguing that at all um, but uh, I mean, so just talking about the physical and, and Doug taught me this person last time we spoke to him, Robert McLean says, Ray Harryhausen was a God. Yes. <laughs> so God. yeah, I, I have learned and they made me watch, um, they made me watch Army of Darkness, Army of Darkness. skeletons that were all <laughs> in the <laughs> Harryhausen the out of here. <laughs> yeah. So I have learned Harryhausen. So yes, I, I appreciate the practicality and I also, but I do also. That, and that movie used like every trick they had, I mean, you know, uh, you know, it was like they used they used models, they used puppets, they used uh, animate, you know, a stop action photography. I mean, it was like the smorgasbord of effects. Of real effects. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a charm. There's a charm that old style uh, stop motion animation has. Although ILM had been developing it to a point where it almost it didn't look like animation anymore. You know, they had that go motion. You know, where they would blur. You know, because Harryhausen stuff. Blur there's no. Yeah, there's there's no motion blur. 
it's all crystal clear all the way through and he couldn't do anything with it in post to give it that. They, you know. they actually to this they still use stop action to this day. There actually is some stop action on the Mandalorian. Um it's a little clip, but they they did it and they used it and they the were excited. I will to say do it. About, the thing Which, I will say about Favreau that is that he likes to indulge himself from time to time. And he did it on Orville. That's why there was a physical model. He wanted to shoot with a physical model to indulge himself. It wasn't something that they kept using. Um, for instance, the stages on Orville, that ship is two decks. It literally really is two decks. When they go up the spiral staircase, it's to another whole deck. And that's like a guy like John Favreau can, can do things like that and will do things like that just to, because he wants to play who wants to play that? I want to be able to do a shot where they go all the way upstairs and there's no cut and there's no effects, you know? So Favreau, he could, he could, he could really push the boundaries uh, on Mandalorian. You know, I mean, he's, that guy has a lot of, you know. What was, and I think we talked a little bit about this before we started, but what was your favorite episode to work on across, you know, all the, all the, uh, the four, I guess, uh, different Star Treks that you worked on? Hands down, Trials and Tribulations. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's no contest. I mean, why? Yeah. Why? Tell us about that. Oh, come on. You can answer that question. <laughs> I, I can. Yeah, of course I can. Remember, but I think our know. audience wants we to We want hear. our audience to know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the most amazing process. Right, Doug? I mean, everybody was. Uh, I'll, so I'll never forget when Mike told us. I couldn't believe it. We were going to get to walk on the Enterprise. I mean, I mean no one had really done it before. That that was a childhood dream to walk down the corridors of the Enterprise. I mean, yeah. How, and, how, and, I, and of course, the never, beauty you, of it in is in a million years, you'd never imagine you'd really get to do that. And not only that, did we really get to do that, we got to help make it happen. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was fantastic. Well, I mean, for one thing, Herman was busy on one of the features. Feature films, yeah. Insurrection. Yeah, I think it was Insurrection. So we were kind of left in charge of the TOS stuff. I mean, Randy McElvain was there most of the time, the art director. And then we would work closely with the set designers, which we usually didn't do. But we didn't have blueprints, right, Dougie? We didn't yeah. have blueprints. No, there were no blueprints. We had nothing. We had our memory and our eyeballs, and we would and do... We, and we had a big pile of VHS tapes. tapes and we would yeah. do Polaroids. And you couldn't do frame grabs. No, nope, you know, we, we did they, Polaroids. Yeah, they, we had a machine that spit out Polaroids of frames yeah. that we wanted. <laughs> but the thing was that I think we had been uh, uh, training for that episode since 1966. Yep. I mean, we all had stuff that we had archived because you couldn't yet go on the computer and type in Enterprise Bridge and come up with 50,000 things that you could download. There wasn't any of that. Uh, and, you know, we had VHS tapes. You had to, like, run the tape to a point in the thing. And it... it... And we, 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 had, we had some fan blueprints and, and all the years that we spent going... Well, that's accurate, but that should be curved, or that should be whatever. All that, all that suddenly came came spilling out of our collective brains. <laughs> now, and I think it was this episode. You guys told this story on one of your tours up in Ticonderoga, and I thought this was pretty funny. And it was about the uh, the ladder where it says environmental services or environmental uh, engineering or something, and and you were looking for that mesh kind of metal and there was a funny they, story how you ended up finding that they, had, uh, they they couldn't uh they couldn't find the mesh they, they found a mesh that didn't particularly look like it uh doug was was very disappointed uh, at it and i said doug this is as good as they're gonna get let's just let's just walk away from it then one day doug and i are walking to the stage and well, the thing was that herman called us down to look at what you know, that, that they couldn't find it. They had this, uh, it wasn't it at all. And to us, this little alcove was like one of the fantastic places on the ship, you know? I mean, it was always impressive to see someone coming down the ladder and there was that sign, environmental, you know, engineering. Well, anyway, they couldn't get it. And we just figured it was, we were gonna have to, you know. All I know is that Mike and I are walking along and all of a sudden th there's a little, it, back lot is digging a trench. They're like changing water pipes or something under the pavement. And I look over and there's this mesh that goes around it. It's 
like you know OSHA construction art. Fence. Yeah, a flexible thing. And I look, and it's like, oh my god, it is almost exactly the size and shape of the hexagons that are on that grill. And I I grab Mike by the shoulder, and I just go look. <laughs> There's our mesh. <laughs> and we ran, and we got a pair of clippers and clipped out a piece of it. Maybe someone fell in that trench after we stole that piece. <laughs> but the, the but the other other thing was the uh, the bad mesh was already installed, was already ready to go, and and the construction department had 127 things to do. But we went up to uh, I think it was Greg Medina. I think it was Greg Medina, one of the, one of the construction four people, and uh, uh, Doug explained it to them, and Greg uh, and I'm going. Greg is justifiably going to go. I just can't do this. And yeah. to my surprise, he said, yeah, we'll do that. We'll make it work. Well, the thing was that we always had a great relationship with the guys in the mill, the construction guys. They were like part of the family. They'd come up and hang out with us because we all just liked each other a lot. And so it, you know, I mean, it, it pays to, to be able to be on good terms with everybody because they might not have done it for somebody else. They, they didn't have to because they had, they had already built what was designed. Yeah, they didn't have to, but and they wanted that, us to be happy. That, they that wanted us to be down, happy. That's what it was. That hands down, that That's is awesome. the most fun. And we had a lot of fun doing other stuff, but this was really our Star Trek. I mean, this is the original series, which is the most- Our hearts leapt. Yeah. Our I mean, hearts it, leapt it, when we heard about it. We could not believe we got, that we were going to And we that. got to really be kind of the experts in how it was supposed to be done right. And um, it was really nice to be able to be Star Trek fans and be called upon to make it right. And there's also, a, there's also uh, not, it's not just unique to this episode, but there's also a, um, a living on the edge, living on the edge uh, sense to it all because when you when you watch a movie or a television show and you and you, you just take it all in but when you're actually making it it's like you're not sure what's you're you're not sure what you're going to find you're not sure how much time there is and there's, and again there's 127 other things you've got to be doing so what's the best you can do uh because i can't put too much time into this because i got to do something else so you're, you're 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 scrambling you're tr you're trying to do the best you can you know it's not perfect but you uh you got to get as many things as you can, as good as you can, and not and not go put all, everything here and then and then five other things go bad. And you got to remember, we had a finite amount of time, and we usually yeah. have seven to ten working days before we start shooting this episode. Now we got more time because the direct the uh, writers gave us a heads up, so we had some additional time. But we were scrambling. Um, we were really scrambling the whole. The so whole you time. had you had basically what ten to fifteen days from the time you found out you were doing this to the time they were shooting it to build that. No, no not this episode. This episode no. we had more time. Oh. I don't remember how much more time. Well, the well, is that Bruce Playfair was asking how long did it take basically to. Yeah, go I saw that. Time. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember how much time specifically, yeah. a, but a typical episode has seven working days from the, from the time you get the script to the time you start shooting. This one, we, we, we actually did have uh, quite a bit more time, but this was the first time we were doing a large recreation of, uh, 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 of the original series. And it actually took a lot of time. Uh, some years later, when we did Inner Mirror Darkly for Enterprise, we found out about it seven working days before we started shooting the, that first episode. So, uh, but fortunately, we had already had done a lot of research for trials and tribulations, so we could go back to that stuff. But it was. Now, uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, you. and it's and there's always, uh, you know, you always look back and you go, if I just had one more hour, just two more days, whatever. Uh, one of the things that was a big disappointment to me on um, uh, um, trials and tribulations was the headers in the corridor. We didn't have the. Uh, uh, that that moray pattern uh, 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 plastic material we couldn't find it, and again, again, the internet existed, but not to the extent that it. That it this doesn't. is one of Mike's shining moments. Yeah, uh, I kind of. I, you I, made I, it work. I this is a perfect example. I faked it in Photoshop. It was not as good as the real thing, but it's what we could what we could do on the. Uh, yeah, who knew it was just drum skin? Well, it wasn't drum skin. It was. Uh, 
I, I again, I, I, I did, I did a, a more pattern in, uh, in Illustrator and, and I distorted it in Photoshop and had it printed and that, and that was it. Well, um, the thing was that, like I said, we didn't have internet yet. If we had internet, we probably could have found the stuff, you know, and gotten it in time, but there was no way to hunt for it then. There was absolutely no way to hunt for it. People didn't have websites and stuff like that. Right. Well, so you couldn't even- Mike made that and, and you look at it in the show, it totally works. Yeah. yeah. But uh, a few years later, when we did uh, uh, In a Mirror Darkly, uh, not only did Ned exist, but uh, I, I, I called, uh, I called James, and he said, "Oh, this is this is where we bought it." So I, got, I got a big roll of stuff, and uh, we put it up. And then after after the episode was was finished, I, I just had the, uh, I had the mill send send the rest of it to, uh, to Ticonderoga. <laughs> well, you know the thing and was that trials that. and tribulations, trials and tribulations was kind of the spark to what happened in Ticonderoga because that's how I met James and James had been talking to uh, Bob Blackman. He knew that James knew what all the materials were for the uniforms and he wanted to get everything. You know, if the material's not right, it doesn't look right. And uh, he, James was on the phone a lot with Bob and he wanted to talk original series. And uh, Bob, appreciates the original series, but he's not geeky fans like we are. And uh, he put him through to the art department because he knew that we would get right in on the conversation and uh, which we did. And uh, uh, James, we, we actually sent him copies of the blueprints that we did. Uh, and he started making, he had the turbo lift alcove and part of Scotty station or something. And I used to kid around you know, when you make your episode, I'll do some shots <laughs> because I was just beginning to play with CG at the time. And I never thought in a million years <laughs> that he was going to end up doing what he did. Oh my God. Yeah. But so uh, that was, it was Trials and Tribulations was a pivotal moment for us in so many ways. Now, jumping back to Relics, you built just a small section of the bridge, right? If I remember, it's just kind of like a wedge almost to, to shoot and then the rest was filled in. Or how did you do that exactly? The uh, for relics, uh, we didn't have any kind of bump in the budget, and and we we had we had those seven days, or, or however many day, days we had, and so uh, our producers figured out pretty pretty early on that they that there's no way they could possibly build the uh, the entire bridge, but our production designer Richard James had a brilliant idea. He said, look, why don't we just build a little bit of the bridge? And for the wide shot, um, maybe we can find a shot of the empty bridge from the from the show itself. So I called Denise and I said, hey, um, what episode do we see an empty bridge? And uh, and Denise, Denise uh, uh, told me it was uh, the, side the, side, the side of paradise. And and that was that was a key because if if uh, if there had not been a way to make the original series bridge, Plan B was they were gonna uh, they were gonna uncrate the uh, uh, the existing pieces of the Enterprise A bridge that were that were in storage. So Scotty would have gone back to the Enterprise A, and that was certainly a beautiful set. It would have looked great, but it would it would wouldn't have had a fraction of the emotional impact. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I, said, I think when I when I saw that episode as a T, you know, as an original series fan, you know, again, you wanted to see that bridge again alive. You know what I'm saying? You just, yeah. it, it was just as a fan, it was just all the times you guys did it and brought it back. And of course, now we have it in Ticonderoga. So anybody, if any of you guys haven't been that are watching, you, you really got to go. Go see oh that. God. We tell everybody, <laughs> just go. I mean, because it, you will just like, I always tell the the people when I first they were still doing new voyages when I got involved and I know the show's not about me but I'm gonna tell the story really quick <laughs> but I went up there uh you know I through meeting people online and and, and they, they said yeah why don't you I'll, I'll come up and you, know, you can see the place because I'm only live about two hours from there so I went up and Gary Evans who has passed unfortunately uh met me there and 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 nobody was around I don't even think James is around so I didn't even meet anybody but the the, the studio was dark you know, they had paper down on the floor because they're trying to protect the carpets. And Gary's like, go ahead and just walk around, you know, have a look around. And I hit the corridor 
you know, the curving corridor and I, my knees got weak. I mean, it was just like, you couldn't believe it. You're there, you know, and this wasn't even lit or anything. It was just, so the go, it's amazing. It, it's it really is for Star Trek, it's a Mecca. <laughs> when we were doing, when we were doing relics, uh, uh, Denise and Doug were actually officially working on Deep Space Nine, but of course, you know, you, you, you couldn't keep them away. They, uh, they, they helped it in any way they could. So we were we were piddling around on, on the stage. It was it was I think it was a Friday evening. Uh, shooting had finished. Everybody had gone home. Uh, but we uh, we were we were uh, we were genuinely working on the bridge. So I um, this is in the days in the ancient days before uh, before cell phones. I go to this uh, I go to this uh, to the phone on the on the stage wall and I call uh, Ron Moore, the writer. Who had been one of the writers on the episode and i said hey ron uh, uh you got a moment he goes well I'm, I'm kind of busy right now i said ron whatever you're doing drop it come down to stage nine come come down now so he so he said okay so a few minutes later he toddles on in and his jaw drops and you see this look in his eyes and Denise says, "Go sit in the captain's chair." And then, she, and then she grabs Doug and I and, and and pulls us away. So he could have his moment of just sitting there and taking it in. It's very powerful. I mean, it's uh, it's very moving. Um, and those of you who haven't been to Ticonderoga, uh, you know, just get there because yeah. it's. Yeah, Michael and Mary Beth, you see that all the time people uh, uh, visiting those sets. But at, that, at this time, there was no place in the world you could do that except right. this one right. little piece of stage I, nine. I, I mean, we, when we, we did the sets, we did, they were kind of done piecemeal, you know, but we never had everything like you guys have. We didn't have engineering. We didn't, have, you know, for us to have to go and be able to see it just as it existed in 1966, that, that was mind blowing for us. You know? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and lighting is what I did when I was doing television production work. So I get to do a lot of, I did a lot of lighting on that set and, and engineering was one of the things that I, I put a lot of time and effort into. And, um, especially with getting the, the warp core or the plasma condo, whatever you want to call it, where it's kind of that forced perspective and getting that lit. And we had, uh, John and B. Joe Trimble come by Yes, BJ. and yeah. now they were on those original sets. They, they had seen them. And, and B. Joe said, she's like, you guys got engineering, you nailed it. You, that's exactly what it looked like. The, you know, the lighting, she specifically said lighting. And my heart left because I was like, that was, a, that was like the biggest compliment I could have ever gotten, you know, from anybody was that, you know, that we nailed it. Cause we were, but we're working off nice screen grabs, you know, from you know, James always would pull them off the Blu-rays and just copy it and print it out so we could, have pretty accurate so i won't want to say that it was my necessarily my skill i was just copying what finnerman did <laughs> yeah it, it takes a, it takes a lot of skill and, and technical knowledge to, to pull to pull off what you did when we when we walk through it it's uh the the sense of the lighting is is palpable it's all at home, it's all at home. yeah yeah you know, it, it, and let me tell you we are the kind of people well, you know, just like you, but I mean, when something's wrong, if something is off a little bit, it just stands out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And the average person doesn't notice, but there, it was, it's just fantastic. Uh, it, so, it's hard to describe. So when you did the Enterprise, how did the Enterprise Mirror Darkly episodes end up? Is that something that just came out of one of the writers or how was the influence to actually because that is one of their most popular episodes, those that's my episodes I, certainly. I, um, I don't actually know uh, this was uh, second half of the fourth season we were just the episodes were uh, were very difficult and we were just we were just scrambling all the time and, and of course there was always there were all the rumors floating around that this is going to be the last season so we were we were just trying trying to go from one from one minute to the next, and the answer is I I, I don't I don't know how they how they came about. Yeah. Okay, well, so <laughs> well, like you said it, it is one of the certainly it's a great episode. Um, 
I think one of the things I like about it is the fact that it really doesn't tie in the the prime. It, was, it, was prime. it just stays. It's just solely in, and you kind of find out what may have happened or did happen mm -hmm. to Defiant. You know. Yeah, the Defiant. Yeah. So. <laughs> It sounds like all your work, I'm going to call them the retro episodes, it sounds like all that work was just labors of love. Um, young Master Fez wants to know um, what was, I think he means the most challenging piece. What was the hardest piece you guys had to do for any of the shows you did? What was the most difficult, challenging thing that you were like, did anything stump you? Did anything really give you cause to pause? For me, the hardest single project was the Enterprise A bridge in Star Trek V because uh, the Star Trek movies were very, very tightly budgeted. And for a long time, I was the only graphics person on it. Uh, I, I had an assistant who, would, uh, uh, who was actually working on TNG, but uh, she would help out. Uh, uh, Denise and I were dating at the time. She would come up in the evenings and, and, she, and I'd put her to work. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was, I don't know, about 12 weeks working uh, seven days a week. And it was, it, it was wow. tough. I think for me, it, well, it comes down to time, but on Star Trek, the feature Star Trek VI, we had to make all of the uh, normal condition graphics and then all the red alert graphics for the bridge. And that was really, so we had to do two conditions, like double the work yeah, it was, in, a, it was in a very, very short hand, period of time. Very labor intensive. And then we had five weeks to gear up uh, for Enterprise. That's it. I mean, we got no breaks between Voyager going down and Enterprise going up and That's it, true. no time off. We were exhausted and yet we had five weeks to do everything on Enterprise. Yeah. And Enterprise was especially difficult because at the uh, before we started, the producer came to me and said, look, what you did on, uh, on Next Generation and Voyager and, uh, and Deep Space Nine, we don't want you to do any of that. We want, we want it to be very, very different. And I explained to them, look, uh, the reason the, the, the Starfleet graphics look the way they do on, uh, on Next Generation it wasn't primarily, this is how I think the 24th century should look. It was what's the fastest, most economical uh, way that you can produce, you can produce a lot of graphics in a short amount of time. And that, that, that was the cornerstone of what, of what we did on Next Generation. So anything you change is gonna cost more money and take more time. Uh, so we wanted little, little buttons and that, that was a whole adventure. And we wanted physical panels, that was a whole adventure. Uh, uh, Denise spent weeks fi finding the, uh, the, the, the computer monitors we had and, uh, tell them the story of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the first day of shooting on the bridge. Oh, the first day of shooting very quickly. Uh, we had never been allowed to fire up all of the monitors with the, with the, with the, uh, animation it wasn't ready on Friday and they wouldn't let us on, work on the weekends. And so Monday we were shooting and we got to the studio like at four o'clock in the morning and we had a glitch. And um, anyway, long involved story. None of the monitors no, worked. None of, none of the, it, they, it, and so we had to solve this thing. And so, um, were you there, Doug? I can't remember. Were you there? You I, I, were there right toward the- I remember the sense of- of panic. Yeah, and we had <laughs> called Jim Van over who did the animation and he wasn't picking up the phone. And so Mike and I had all these books out. We were trying to figure out what was going up. Oh, it was a nightmare. I've never been, the adrenaline was, I just wanted to run out the gates. It was horrible. And 30 seconds <laughs> before the cameras rolled, we got it to work. You do not want to be, it was you do not want to be, on the production schedule that oh. says camera held up by video playback right you know, yeah. or makeup held up camera 20 i mean yeah. every minute is huge yeah. amounts of money and, and it's the worst feeling it's oh yeah it was... and it, it was it was absolutely not our fault because uh a producer who should remain nameless would not give us permission to come in 
uh, on, 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 the, on the weekend, weekend. and we really okay. needed to but i but i absolutely guarantee you had that computers not work it would have been our fault yep even though it was this, uh this, this this person's fault so actually in answer to your question the most difficult thing we've ever done or i've ever had to solve it's that it's that yeah uh, the, oh, the Doug's. video playback room that was off this that was on the stage right next to the bridge you know denise and mike and the video playback guys had kind of worked it out on ds9 but it kind of grew as they developed it when they did enterprise now they took everything they learned on deep space nine and built this amazing video village that had all of these cubes computer cubes and it it was really it was as impressive to see that as it was to see the bridge set itself yeah that was, that was our key video engineer uh, ben betts who was our technical genius on on that one he did an amazing job yeah, it really was fantastic. I want to hear, Doug, did you have something that was your most difficult or challenging? Well, I mean, there were lots of things that were really difficult. <laughs> there, were, there were lots of things. I mean, um, uh, I think the most stressful stuff was probably makeup because you had to be there really? on camera, you know, and they're looking at it through a camera. You don't know how they're going to set it up or how they're going to light it, you know. Um, before computers, makeup was a camera trick. It's rubber, light doesn't pass through it. You know, you could hold up the camera. That that's, was most stressful. We had plenty of things in art department that were bigger than that, but the thing was that you had most of it worked out by the time they got mm -hmm. to camera. There were no surprises that would happen to you right there, once in a while, you know. Um, but probably the hardest thing, the most stressful thing <laughs> was uh, designing the NX. Mike knows. Really? Uh, well, you know, a hero ship really gets the magnifying glass put on it. Everybody's involved. Everybody's putting in their two cents. John Eves, I think, did 30 different designs for the NX. And they kept sending them back, sending them back, sending them back. And it wasn't that John didn't do a good job. John always does a good job. But the thing is that they want to see every possible thing right up to the last second. Even if you showed them a 10, 100 really super things, they still want to see everything you could until there was no more time. And so they got to a point where um, uh, John had to start doing other things. He could, couldn't spend any more time on the ship. And Mike said to Herman, um, Doug is at, up at Foundation Imaging. And he's, you know, learned a lot of, as far as CG goes. Why don't you bring Doug back and he could bring what he learned and you got, you two guys can work on the, the ship. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so I got a call. Mike warned me. And then when Herman called me, I'm like, well. I, I didn't said, warn you, but I gave you the good news. <laughs> he gave me the good news. It was, are you kidding? It's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. He's still, of course. But so that when Herman called me, I said, well, Herman, I, yes, that, how could I, you know, it's an offer you can't, oh my God, would I ever, the thing is, I can't just leave. I say, I have to give him two weeks notice before I can come in. Well, Herman says, well, Doug, what time do you get off of work? <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh. And I, well, I usually get off around six. He says, well, I'll be at your house by 6.30. So every night after a long day of work, I'd come home and Herman would be sitting on the front step waiting for me. And he would sit behind me while I was at the computer while we were trying things. That's really, that's some stress whoa, there. You know, first of all, you love Herman. You want to do a good job for him. You don't want to let him down. I'm kind of wading into something that is still new to me. I was pretty, you know, still a neophyte really uh with that stuff and uh uh so we did that for two weeks before i came back to the art department i i still have a picture uh, you guys made a big sign that went on the wall it said welcome home doug you know and it was such a thrill i think i climbed up on my desk which was still in the same spot and just like laid there and wallowed in my desk kissed the desk, kissed the desk. <laughs> i was so happy oh my god i was so happy to be back but, but also know, the thing is but also a lot of the stress that uh, that you experienced in that, that time, that was self-imposed because certainly certainly Eves understands how important a, a oh, hero yeah. is and everybody. Yeah. But to 
Doug uniquely, like 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 the rest of us, he was the Star Trek fan who suddenly is getting to design the next Enterprise. <laughs> you cannot put more pressure on him than he already had on oh him. Oh my God! He, well, you knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. I mean, you know, a lot of people were involved, and Mike and I would sit for hours and talk about, you know, why things might be certain ways on the ship. And there, I did not do a single thing on the ship without Mike and I looking at it together and talking about it, you know? I felt like the details really were sweated more on that ship than any other enterprise, you know? Is it true that the bridge set, you meant to deliberately evolve that bridge set over the season so that it would change from being uh, what well, kind of what we saw to by the end looking much more like that's totally uh, Mike. Mike had a whole uh, plan from the beginning of how the yeah, graphics and were we didn't evolve. get to see it that much. You, you did a, you did a little bit. It, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't that, it wasn't the grand plan. It was just we had these computer hey. monitors, and on the side of the monitor side of, side of each monitor was a was a co was a column buttons a column a column of little little square icons little blinkies. And I had I had a I had a column of icons on the side of, of every single uh, uh, computer screen, and then in the second season I added another column, and like, in the, and then the third or fourth season I added a, a third one. And my I, my idea was over time we would start to see more and more of these little square blinky icons. The colors eventually, were coming. Eventually, you might start to think, oh wait a minute, that's what they had in the original Enterprise. That's all it was. And then, and then Doug, but it makes a big to see that. See, that's part of what makes the Star Trek that we worked on was very as much as possible tied to the original series. It was there was a thread that ran all the way through, and you wanted to see everything stay within the original series was always foremost in everyone's mind when working on any of those shows. And we didn't deviate, you know. We Part, that's part of the love. We want people at we home wanted, to watch we wanted it. To pay, we wanted to pay homage to it. We wanted to respect it. We wanted we wanted to we wanted to show much, how how much that that was pivotal to what we were doing. And we knew there were people at home who would go, look, look what they did. Look what they did. There's the, you know, <laughs> you know. And people responded to it. They knew that there were geeky fans working on it. You know. Now the re the refit was supposed to come in what in episode five that you designed, or was that? I mean, that was that was that the plan that that you designed there was the refit. No real plan for the NX refit. I had when I was designing it, I kept a secondary hull next to the CG model I was building and would place the hull and look at it with a hull, just because I had the idea in my head that we might be able to evolve the ship. And eventually have a secondary hull. I wanted to balance right, mm -hmm. and I sh I showed it to Manny Cotto, and he liked it. He thought it was a great idea, but we never got to go any further because we got we were canceled. You, you know, let me tell you a story. You know how you know that you might be canceled because they won't tell you anything. Mike, Denise, and I started noticing people coming in the department with tape measures measuring. <laughs> 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 measuring walls and stuff and we looked at each other and we said that's not a good sign oh no remember that for those of you guys who don't know what i'm talking about if you just google uh, the enterprise nx01 refit that doug designed and you'll see it it's on the web but it basically what, incorporates i mean the, the thing was that we had never seen a ship evolve before right uh, there were always enterprises but they didn't evolve and we thought it would be so much fun if they went out for the first four years and got their asses handed to them. Meanwhile, all of the data is going back to Starfleet and they're building a secondary hull, you know, during the third season that the Enterprise is going to come back, pull into a dry dock and they would. Yeah, I know, mean, it fits it, seamlessly. It into would be the ready to go. Design. I mean, but it's just... the idea that here's the tadpole yeah. goes out <laughs> and after four years, it grows a pair of legs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fans yeah. reacted really well to it. Uh, and even people who didn't like the ship in the beginning, everyone doesn't like the ship when they first see it because it's not the last ship. Not me. But there were people who didn't like it. But once they found out that we had an idea about where it might go, they were like, oh, oh that makes sense. 
and and that it earned a lot of respect from a lot of people once we did that refit yeah now you guys had told a story when at the voyager was over when they were tearing down those sets that you found something kind of interesting uh if i remember when they were pulling their engineering apart i think or something there's a something maybe oh. that threw back from the original yeah, doug and i were down on stage and they were pulling engineering apart and we looked and we saw this metal we saw this part and doug and i both went oh my god i bet i think that's from phase two and we ran to the phone and called michael and michael hurried down and indeed it was the it was the onion peeling back they just built the upon that and that was part of uh that's you know, what was so amazing about those sets they were until the end of it until enterprise i yeah. guess all the sets were built on the footprint of the motion picture sets because all the utilities were already there you know i mean why you know you don't build a whole new thing um uh, uh so it was kind of an archaeological dig if you look behind things or peeled some paint away somewhere you'd find elements of other shows and that was part of what was so amazing about it um you know when i started working on tng as a makeup artist i was so thrilled to be on those sets because i was a big fan of them already and to actually see them in person was, uh, you know, mind boggling. The beauty of them because of Mike really was that the more you looked at them, the more real they became because I started looking at his graphics from this far away. And I'm like, <laughs> holy crap, what the hell? This guy's amazing. <laughs> and I would go through engineering and follow the flow charts and go, this isn't just sci-fi baloney. That's what I always loved about Star Trek. You know, um, a lot of science fiction shows just do oh it's cool uh, give me something cool it wasn't just about being cool it was about making sense that's why so many friends at jpl and stuff they love as i was going to say you isn't know, it half the engineers at jpl have they have your uh, your okudograms as yeah. a on their screens screen. you know their screen savers <laughs> hey mike you remember when stephen hawking came in oh yeah Steven, well, you got to tell the story. You can't oh. just. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the story goes that uh, you know the great professor Stephen Hawking is is uh, is maneuvering his wheelchair through the uh, uh, through the set. And he stops in the engine room and and uh, he doesn't point, but uh, they're explaining him uh, the uh, 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 the warp yeah. the warp core, the matter and antimatter, and all that good stuff, and he just says, "Yeah, I'm working on that." <laughs> and everyone burst into laughter, but the laughter trailed off because yeah. everyone realized he's not kidding. He's not kidding. No, no, no we weren't. We weren't there when that happened because I was actually off the lot for a uh, uh, for a meeting, and I came back and some people and Denise says Stephen Hawking's here. Now I remember Mike Pillar. I, I was standing outside eight and nine, and Mike Michael Pillar and the writer and producer Michael Pillar and and Rick Berman came uh off their cart and they ran it, and we were filming the light you know the little gumball light was going on and you're not supposed to go inside when we're filming obviously and they didn't care they just opened the door and ran right in because stephen hawking was in there. <laughs> you know hawking asked to be lifted out of his wheelchair and put in picard's chair so after, really, after, uh, really? Oh, oh, wow. yeah. I know. after he'd finished touring the set is, is when is when i arrived and denise says he's there so i'm uh, I want to say hi to Stephen Hawking. And you think of Stephen Hawking as he's, he's a guy in a wheelchair and you think, well, you know, you can go to our kind of tools around along. And we, 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 uh, we, we sprinted out the, uh, out the door and caught up with him in the, in the parking lot. And again, you, you think of a wheelchair as something being something fairly slow and Hawking is motoring. <laughs> yeah. and we had, had to, to run yeah, to catch yeah. up. He's supercharged, huh? <laughs> he really was. Yeah. So he was, he was, he was, he was, he was warping across the, the park. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You know, and, was, and then they asked crazy. him to do an episode, and we went down and saw Stephen Hawking sitting with Data and Sir Isaac Newton right. and Albert Einstein. <laughs> oh my God, so fantastic! Well, those yeah. were wonderful years, you know. Um, we of course have gone on and done other things and, and, but nothing, nothing matches the time that we had together. And, um, you know, we all treasure it and, uh, we have, you know, long lasting friendships because of it. And, um, I think 
you know, our deep, deep love of Gene Roddenberry, Star Trek, and the philosophy mm -hmm. that carried us through. And Doug is fond of saying, and I totally agree with him, when we meet other Star Trek fans, they're like family. And because we have this common bond um, and it's very strong. And, um, and I'm, you know, I miss, I miss, I miss that. I miss uh, working with people yeah. and I, and I miss having that feeling of hope and optimism for the future mm -hmm. um, that just doesn't seem to be radiating today. Roddenberry was always, you know, in, in the, you know, the front of, uh, forefront of our minds, uh, everything that we did, you know, what would Gene want? What would Gene like? You know, um, uh, that, that Gene was the heart and soul of all those shows right up until the end of Enterprise. Um, well, we. I, I, I had to get to I mean, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I it just uh, I, when I first was doing makeup, uh, uh, I, I was over at the craft service table, and uh, the second AD comes over. This is hardly anyone knew me yet, uh, and said, "Are you Doug Drexler?" And I was like, "Yeah," and she says, "Mr. Roddenberry would like to speak to you." And I was like, "Oh my God." Am I fired? <laughs> and she led me around onto the bridge. And Gene was sitting on the back of the bridge in the tall director's chair. And he just wanted to shake my hand and tell me what a great job we did on Dick Tracy. That's really unusual to get a compliment like that because they don't want you to get too full of yourself, you know? It's true. Uh, but that was such an unbelievable moment. Do you remember what episode that was? I can't remember what episode it was. It was early third season. I mean, it was, I don't know. It was, was it before yesterday's Enterprise? That was another time I ran into him on stage. He was watching me work on everyone. It's just really weird. A guy like me, you know, or any one of us, imagine that you're on an Enterprise bridge. It's Enterprise uh, B, C, C. Uh, and uh, you're working. And then you look behind you and Gene Roddenberry sitting in a tall director's chair watching you work. That's like. <laughs> 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 hey, Mike, I was going to say this forever, but thanks for hiring me into the art department. You have no idea. You have an idea. <laughs> thank, really you for being, thank you for being such an important part of, of the show. Thank you for putting in a hundred and ten percent. Oh, thinking of things that I never would have thought of for uh, for always being there to come up with uh, with cool stuff. But we, we were just we like were so a bunch lucky. of little kids. We just we were like kids playing. We we had so much such a good time together. There's a big difference between working on something cool and working with a bunch of divas, you know, who don't want to hear your idea or they're just a pain in the ass. And then working with a family that you feel protected by and that everyone loves each other. They know they can, we have a shorthand. You can anticipate what the other person's gonna say. There are times we didn't even have to talk. You know, there were nights where me and Denise were in, in ops with no lights except flashlights, putting tape on things, you know? I mean. <laughs> well, I think from, from a fan who watched all the shows and I watched them all before I ever met any of you, I think it now knowing you, it shows your passion for for the show. And we as fans, thank you for for what you did with Star Trek uh, while you worked on it, because I think you did keep that thread of the original series going uh, that those of us that grew up on the original series uh, want and want to see. And unfortunately, you guys aren't working on the current stuff, but um, thank you for all that you've done up to that well, there, point. There, there. There were a lot of nights, you know, no matter how much you love the job, the pressure gets to you. It, re it really does. And one of the things we always would say to each other was, uh, no matter how bad this might be, and it, it really wasn't bad, it was just a lot of pressure. Uh, you always think there's that out there, there there's, a, there's a 12 year old who's gonna love this show. He or she's gonna love the show as much as we love the original. So we're not doing it for us. We're not doing it for Rick Berman. We're not even doing it for Gene Roddenberry. We're doing it for that kid. For, yeah, that's for, really true. We always her. knew that because we had been through it. I remember really early on talking to Denise about how we would feel when an episode ended. 
Remember that? There was something about that original series that left you in like almost a trance. Like yeah. you had, mm-hmm. like you're, you were in an alpha state, you know, and we both, it, it, re- it really was remarkable. And, you know, thank you for saying that because what could be better than to hear that? Because that's what we wanted, you know. Um, one of the things I have to say is it's very easy to get your feelings hurt if you're not working on the new show. I, I, I under, it's understandable. You're so closely tied to it. It's such an important part of your life and you even feel like you help keep it going. Well, you know, before there was any new television shows. Uh, the, the thing that I always have to remember is it's the art director or the production designer always wants to work with people he's worked with before. And nine times out of 10, they're not really big Star Trek fans. They've been hired to do a job. So they go to their go-to people and they don't spend an awful lot of time researching what happened before. They only as much as they need to because their hair's on fire. They're under a lot of pressure to make those shows, you know? And, and it's not because they said, well, we don't want that guy. Maybe they did. <laughs> it's possible, I guess. What do we want that guy for? But, but uh, you know, I, 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 I do have twinges of feeling bad, you know, that I'm not a part of it because I feel like I should always be on Star Trek. I know you guys do too. I don't know how I'd feel about being on the new Star Trek because they feel kind of corporate to me, you know. Uh, it's I a different like shows. I, 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 we feel very, we feel very protective and uh, about Star Trek. I mean, it's a business, and you know we get it, but we feel very protective about Star Trek. But again, would I don't, I don't know, given how we what we went through and what how we worked um, going into you know because things have changed so much. Uh, in production and so forth and so on. You know, I don't know if we would be happy or not. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I, one thing I'm pretty sure of is that uh, there wouldn't be the same kind of trust that we had when we worked on the other shows. We were given a free hand, really, free reign. We, Times have changed, we, too. We were approached early on to work on uh, on Discovery. Discovery. And for a while, it looked like uh, 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 Denise and I and Doug were going to get to uh, go up to... Um, Toronto, uh, yeah, uh, t- Toronto, and and we were we were excited for a while, and then they started crunching the numbers, and they realized, well, you know, it's it it didn't make financial sense for them to fly people up and put them up in uh, uh, in you know in in a, in a new city in in Toronto, and for a while we were we were pretty disappointed, and still am in a, in, in in some ways, but you know it's. It, as they always say, it's, it's not personal, it's, it's business, and the, yeah. the, decision, the decision makes sense. Well, you know, I remember it really looked like we were going to be the graphics department again. Yeah. And we, were so far, we weren't hired yet, but we were so far enough along where Mike was sending me pictures of stuff where he said, I think that when we do the Klingons, we should be moved. You know, the, the wheels were already turning mm-hmm. at the point mm-hmm. where they, they decided not to. Yeah, I, I know production designer Mark Worthington who had a lot of really good ideas and, and a lot of them came to fruition in, the, in what they did in the show. So we were disappointed we didn't get to do that. Yeah, but you got to remember, do you remember how Discovery started? They had four, they've had, they had four production designers the first season. So I don't think we would have been happy. I think. Yeah, it's difficult. You I, never I, know, you never know. And I was yeah. trying to figure out if we brought our dogs with us, which of course we were, how in the world would we leave them for that long? And it yeah. snows in Toronto. So it just didn't happen. And maybe it was for the best. You're right, it's business. But just remember that the business of your shows, it transcended business and went straight to our hearts. So well, on that, that's very um, nice. oh, so I'm no. going to run through Roy's tie-dye sci-fi. And then if people want if any other questions, um, they should start typing them now, and then you guys, you guys can tackle. I mean, you guys ended up. I mean, Doug, you're doing the Orville, which is a great, well, yeah, and yeah. certainly plays homage to all the original Star Treks that you guys worked on. Yeah, well, you know, it was like our, Orville is an example. I felt bad that uh, none of that we weren't on it, but being on it, I know now that those guys, it wasn't anything personal. 
they were just going full. They were their their hair was on fire, you yeah. know, and they know who they worked with. Yeah. Um, uh, Orville is a lot more like uh, being on Star Trek. Um, uh, the show is not, you know, we used to do 26 episodes a year, every year. Now it's like 12 episodes and maybe it'll be a year and a half before they do another 12 or two years. So it's like to, to build, I don't, I don't know what it would take. They, I mean, they've learned Robert Strohmeyer and Stephen Line Weaver have really learned to trust me at this point. In the beginning, they knew what I had done and they've seen my work, but you still don't know until you work with someone what it's going to be like. And I finally, I am to the point now where they, they trust me and they feel, you know. They, they, they understand what a tremendous resource they have. Well, they, they and thank you, Mark. And, and, and that's, that actually, you have to earn that. You could show them a lot of pictures, but until you've actually been in the trenches, that's when you, you really get the cred. And, I, and I'm there, you know, at that point. It's a really good, it's, it's, the graphics department is just me. When we were on Star Trek, there were four of us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, there were five. I, I mean, it was Anthony. Yeah. 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 So it's like, I think we ought to have two more graphic artists on the show, you know? Yeah. And, and I constantly think I see Denise. Yeah. I'm working. I do. I swear, I really do. The, my brain will say, there, Denise is right over there. And I'm like, what am I thinking of? I, the flashbacks that I have, you know. <laughs> but the, the nice, the thing that I like about, that's great about Orville is that the show does have a heart and it's Seth MacFarlane. You know, he loves Next Generation and he loves those, uh, those shows. You know, I mean, he was a cameo on Enterprise several times, I think. Uh, and um, uh, he really is, uh, you know, kind of brilliant. I mean, this guy, he writes, he's, he, he directs, he produces, he, sings. he, he sings, does he does albums. He's got, you know, so it's like to have somebody like that, although you'd be surprised, I think he's exceedingly shy. Very How many shy. times does Stewie Griffin come out and uh, does he do the Stewie Griffin voice? On set? No, no, he's, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I haven't ha spent that much time with them because they only do 12 episodes and we're, we're hardly, you know, a quarter of the way through and, you know, you don't, I haven't had, I see him all the time, but we haven't had a, hey, you know, like. Um, um, Does he remember you from Enterprise? I mean, he, he knows. He knows who I am. He knows who I am because, uh, you know, I'm good friends with, um, you know, producer, editor. What's wrong with me? Uh, Tom. Uh, Tom. Tom Constantino. Tom Constantino. We're like buds. And when I he first came to my desk, he was gushing like a little kid. And, uh, he was so excited to meet me. And, and uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, I'm enjoying, you know, when we said that we were doing the work for that kid, we knew who was watching it and believing it and loving it. And Tom is one of those kids. And like um, uh, uh, Brandon Fayette, who's the visual effects supervisor, I was riding in a cart with him and he said, you know, when I was watching Next Generation, I was eight years old. <laughs> you know, laughing. <laughs> so, here be. So, I see some great questions coming in. Um, before we jump to them, I'm just gonna say, you guys, if you like sci-fi of the 60s and 70s, you should be checking out Roy's tie-dye sci-fi. This Friday, he's got Ross Amico from WWFM, the classic station back, and they're gonna talk about Planet of the Apes. And on Sunday, they're gonna do take two with Mark Cushman. He tried to have Mark Cushman on last Sunday um, to talk about These Are the Voyages, his books, but Tech, something was going wrong with Zoom and it just it kept dropping. So they're gonna come back. He's bringing he Mark back. Right back. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> so uh, in the questions, we've got some good ones. I just saw a couple of really good ones scroll by. Um, uh, I, I was gonna say Thomas Marone questions for Mike has recently shared a photo of a concept model of a Klingon cruiser that was never used. Could he talk a little bit about that? And there, are there any other unseen gems uh, you are willing to discuss? Uh, Thomas is talking about a, uh, a, a spec design that I did for, um, for yesterday's Enterprise, the script 
for yesterday's enterprise called for the enterprise being attacked by cavort class battle cruisers and uh i was hoping that we would see a new battle cruiser or at least they're reusing the uh the the battle cruiser from the, from the moon but i wanted to see a, a new klingon ship because we had seen klingon ships on next generation but it, there was always been uh reuses of uh, of ships that have been made for the movies. Those are great models, but I wanted, to, I wanted to see new stuff. So on Friday, I realized there's an opportunity. I, uh, that that weekend, I went on a, a, a hobby store and I, I bought some parts and I and I, I kit bashed together a uh, my idea for a Klingon ship. Monday morning, I brought it in and, and painted it in the art department and and Rick Sternbach helped them give it some battle damage. Uh, they, ultimately, uh, our friends from visual effects, I see, I didn't know what shots they were planning and the, the model really wouldn't have held up uh, for those particular shots. But that's that's the model that, uh, uh, that Thomas is talking about. Cool. Jamal Taylor is asking um, if, and this is hypothetical, if they asked you, three of you, to work on or to contribute to Strange New Worlds, which is the, they're picking up a Pike series with Anson Mount, would you do it? We all three of us, I feel confident in saying, would love love to go back. It it it, it depends. We're uh, uh, Doug is working full time on on, on uh -huh. our, an important part of that team. We're thrilled to be working on Ron Moore's uh, 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 For All Mankind. Excellent and, show. Uh, Great series. Yep. We we made it. We made a commitment to that uh, to those shows and. Uh, but and it's shooting in Canada, right? Probably, I would assume yeah. so. Yeah. I guess I don't yeah. know. Hey, but, uh, Dennis's house is like just and you can crash at Dennis's. <laughs> I bring <laughs> the dogs in Canada. Yeah, bring the dogs. Dog. He's got fancy oh, yards. Yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> but if if they were if they were to invite us and if there were a way to work it out with our existing commitments, are you kidding? <laughs> and it's yeah, I mean, the ultimate you... dream for us would be to to work together again on Star Trek and be able to get yeah. That's and an we're very dream we're very thankful too. for. for for uh, you know, for that show, we're kind of crossing our fingers that they, they cautiously optimistic. Yeah, we'll cautiously see. optimistic. We've always wanted to work together again, and we would love to work together on Star Trek. We obviously love Star Trek, so um, yeah. we'd love to work together again. I mean, they would have to, the stars would have to align. Yeah, it it it, it boils down to one being asked to. To be being available, you being know, available. it's like right now I'm totally committed to Orville. I'm going back right. when this is, you know. Um, uh, oh, he's calling. But, they have their, but they, you know, <laughs> in the business, you 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 work with who you know, and they already have an established team. And if it's up in Canada, they already have their established vendors. So yeah. it's a different world. It's an it's it's a business, and it's an entirely different world. And we're not part of that world, so you would have to have somebody stick their neck out and say, "Hey, remember these guys? I'd love them to work on our show." Yeah. Well, good good, good answer. Uh, so uh, let's see. Um, Ray, uh, Ray, I'm gonna mess this up. Ray Minarchek, is it? Um, do you guys miss dressing up in the costumes and storage? Uh, from TOS. I don't know if you guys had TOS. Really did that one. <laughs> that was a great story, Denise. We only did that once, but it was <laughs> the it biggest was... regret was not, you know, look at we're 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 not the kind of people who want to steal anything, you know. But I I sure wish we had gotten that 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 uh, blue uniform that you put on fit you so perfectly. It just you know. That was, um, that, uh, why didn't we take it? That was uh, Majel Barrett's uh, Nurse Chapel. Um, oh. Amazing. And, yeah, it was really funny too because we were down there and I saw it and I, you know, I didn't know if it would fit. But I, I said, Doug, come here. And I went into a corner. And I said, watch the door because I, I take my clothes <laughs> off and put the uniform on. So Dougie stu stood guard and I put the uniform on. I came out and it fit. And I, we were all like, whoa. It was really fun. That's awesome. Uh, let's see other questions. Um, yes. Gone into uh, what was the biggest contribution uh, each of you feel you made to Star Trek? I think we, 
kind of over yeah i you pretty much covered kind of it. talked about it, it was, yeah it you that you could say well this was it can we can we go back to universe for uh for a moment yeah. <laughs> when, we're, when we were working on um uh, on the remastering of the original series for hd we had a day that we called green oh. screen day let me hi, hi. Lenny. <laughs> Sorry, she gets. Uh, <laughs> we had a day, uh, green screen day. We we borrowed a bunch of uh, of costumes, and basically we dressed everybody at CBS Digital up in uh, in, in uniform, and we marched back and forth in front of, of a green screen, uh, so that they had have little people they could they could stick into matte paintings. Uh, Denise and I had um, actually we uh, 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 James had made us uh, uh, made us costumes so. Denise had a red dress. I had a I had a I had a uh, science. science blue uh, blue shirt. So uh, if you look at the remastered episodes, in a lot of the episodes, in the uh, upper corner of the uh, of the hangar deck, you can see Denise as a, uh, as as a hangar hangar deck technician. And in um, the immunity syndrome, when Spock re returns the uh, returns to land. Uh, you can you can see me as as uh, as Spock's photo double. <laughs> That's cool. I have to go look for that now. <laughs> hey guys, I'm gonna have to bug out. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it is. We it took is. we kept you longer than we should have. We apologize. We kept you longer than oh, it was fun. Sorry. Yeah, we had uh, a great really, time. It's great hanging out with you guys. Great we really you appreciate ladies. you guys doing this. Um, we're always happy to have you back because we could probably continue this on for quite some time. <laughs> Yeah, we don't we don't like talking about Star Trek at all. No, <laughs> neither do we. We hate it. So there he goes. But just I gotta go, lads and Bye. gals. Bye, right, Doug. Thank you for coming. Um, before we'll wrap it up anyway, uh, just well, you know, next week we have yeah. Jeff Barklage, correct? Yeah, Mary next Beth? week Jeff Barklage. Yep. Yeah. We don't know what he's going to talk about. Those of you guys well, don't know, Bar Jeff Barklage is a DP, director of photography. He worked on uh, New Voyages with us. Um, he's going to talk about something. We, we haven't pinned him down on a film or a TV show yet, but you, you, those of you guys that know Jeff, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy and it's going to be a lot of fun talking to him. Um, what am I missing? We already, I already did Roy, well, so we, we are good. Happy Canada Day classes. to our Canadian friends. Um, yep. <laughs> everybody just, stay safe, separated, masks Stay safe, on. stay separated. And thank you so, so, so much, Mike and Denise. And thank you, Doug Drexler, Hopefully for we'll joining us we'll see you guys tonight. in person one of these days soon. Oh, yeah. we're dying. We're dying to come see you guys. It's yeah. just this damn virus. I mean, yeah. it's exploding here in, in Los Angeles. We just had another order to close in dining. Uh, we can't go out to restaurants anymore because some really stupid and ignorant and arrogant people won't wear masks and social masks. distance. Yeah, so the rest of us, thing. So the yeah, rest people, of us please suffer. wear your mask when you're out. Please. You know, it's science. It's not politics, people. I mean, it just makes me crazy. It does. It does. Anyway. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> we'll see you Thank all you next so time, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Okay, take care. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.